can see you, Cyril. Wonderful. Good morning. It's great to see you. Uh, but Cyril, if you can hear me, um, it's good to welcome you uh, to your new role as the primate of, uh, of, your, of your province. Um, uh, Rana has said that, yes, evangelism is close uh, to my heart, um, which is really something that uh, ought to go without being said. Um, but one of the things that has struck me uh, over the years of my um, ministry is that um, for those of us who are in the global north, if I can put it like that, and particularly perhaps for those of us who are in the United Kingdom, where for uh, many, many centuries, certainly in terms of England, uh, the Anglican Church has been the established church, um, evangelism has not perhaps lain as close to the heart of the church as it might have done. I think perhaps that over the years there has been an assumption that the church was there, that the church was to be, uh, should we say, dipped into and dipped out of on various occasions, particularly those connected with what we now term life events, baptisms, marriages and funerals, um, those things which in the past we used to refer to as occasional offices, but that the church, apart from that, for the majority of the population, was not necessarily something actually to be participated in, other than, as I say, for those special occasions. That doesn't mean to say uh, that there hasn't been some participation by the wider population, uh, but by and large, uh, it's that place uh, that people don't go to, but perhaps always want to be there. We have certainly in, in, in Wales over recent decades seen a um, fairly relentless, slow but relentless decline in those who are regular worshippers, whilst at the same time uh, we've seen um, increasing financial demands being placed upon those who are the regular worshippers to maintain the life of the church. And all too often, I fear, that that has been interpreted as maintaining the life of an institution rather than maintaining a family of disciples. Uh, one of the things that we hear spoken about with increasing regularity in our own province is um, about buildings. We have um, too many buildings in too many places. And whilst we acknowledge that the presence of a worshipping community um, reflected in the presence of bricks and mortar in a particular place is one thing, that presence of bricks and mortar does not uh, necessarily or always frequently speak to us of a spiritual building. Uh, as the Apostle Peter puts it in his first letter, we are called to be built as a living temple. As Paul the Apostle put it in his letter to the Ephesians, similarly, we are to be built also into a, a spiritual uh, building with Christ as the cornerstone. And I've said on a number of occasions that perhaps we need to get back to the Great Commission uh, which the disciples were given on the Mount of the Ascension, and as recorded uh, at the end of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. I hope you'll forgive me saying so. Um, whether or not Matthew records an actual historical event, word for word, to me doesn't matter. What does matter is that Matthew's version of the Gospel ends with something very, very clear indeed that your job is to be missionary, your job is to be evangelistic. You might need an institutional framework eventually uh, in order to maintain that primary task, that perhaps I can call it the core business. But if the institution itself becomes an end in itself, then I think we're running into grave, grave danger. And it may well be, it may well be that if we continue to see uh, the pattern of decline to which we've become accustomed, that we are being told fairly directly, fairly clearly, that maybe we have lost sight or are losing sight of what we'd originally called um, to be. So from our own perspective, um, within my own province, 
uh, in terms of mission and evangelism, it's something that I think we need to recover at home. And in my own diocese uh, of Swansea and Brecon, uh, we have, um, I suppose I could call it a strap line. Everybody seems to have a strap line these days. You have to have a crisp little phrase uh, that encapsulates what you're about. Um, and one does sometimes wonder whether we spend too much time worrying about the strap line than actually what uh, the strap line is meant to point to. But nevertheless, if I could just say something about our own, because I would say this, wouldn't I? I happen to think it's rather a good one. Um, it's very crisp, it's gathering and growing and going. And the challenge in that crisp three letter phrase, I think begins with the beginning, gathering. One of the things that God's people in this diocese uh, have to address, one of the questions that they have to pose to themselves is, as what do we gather? Do we gather in a particular place at a particular time with particular people to do the particular things that give us a particular, um, I don't know, a, a particular thrill, if I can put it like that, though I don't see always many thrilled faces around me, I have to say. Um, maybe that's my own fault, I'm not sure. But if you simply are gathering with like-minded people at the same time in the same place to do the same thing over and over again, then something is missing. If on the other hand, you're gathering with, yes, the familiar people, but to address your calling to be disciples, then you can perhaps move on to the second of the line, a uh, second of the words in our strap line, growing. You can begin to grow more deeply into your faith. You can begin to grow more deeply into your understanding of the scriptures. You can begin to grow more deeply into the task of understanding what it is to be good news to the communities in which you're set. And then, and then, once you have grown into that understanding, and only then, I dare say, are you capable and properly equipped to actually go into that community to be uh, that good news, to be the leaven, to be the yeast, to be the light, to be, uh, to be the salt? Too often, I suspect, in terms of um, what we have perhaps loosely termed our evangelism, it's been caricatured, maybe characterized, possibly, as expecting people to come to us. And if they don't come, we blame them for not coming. Whereas what we ought to be doing, and as I've said on countless occasions, is looking in a mirror to see what are we and what have we to which they might actually want to come. But going back to where I began with the gathering a question, if all we expect people to do is to come to us uh, without um, actually having something nourishing, joyful, and um, spiritually strong to offer them. It's rather like, uh, again, as I've said on countless occasions, inviting people to come to your house for a meal and then sitting them at an empty table. There has to be nourishment. There has to be food on the table. And we need to get to grips with preparing, if I can pursue the metaphor, we need to get to grips with preparing the menu for that meal, not expecting people to understand what's familiar to us, but having the capacity and the will and the heart to be able to articulate it and explain it in terms that they uh, understand. One of the ways in which um, evangelism has perhaps been misunderstood in the past is that it can be achieved through rewriting um, orders of service or rewriting um, the music that accompanies an order of service. Uh, as I said in the, the, my last address to our own governing body uh, last week, the most wonderfully crafted, theologically correct, ecclesio ecclesiologically accurate and image-ridden liturgy will remain a blunt instrument in the hands of people who are not expert practitioners. That doesn't mean to say that everybody has to have a doctorate in, the a doctorate in theology or whatever in order to practice 
uh, the faith. But we do have to recognize that sometimes it's the people who need to be attractive in the first place, rather than um, every revision of every prayer that we've ever uttered um, being laid before people. I think what I will do in terms of the local understanding of evangelism is end with one anecdote and then very, very quickly say something about uh, eyes beyond our own back door. Andrew Knight, I think, is one who's on our call and there may well be other clerics from, uh, from the diocese. A number of years ago, um, we invited to come and speak to a gathering of our clergy, um, someone whose name escapes me, John, I can't remember, John somebody. Um, and he spoke to the clergy um, about this whole question of welcome and attraction and openness. And he said a very good question with which to begin to explore uh, whether uh, others would find something attractive in you is to invite your parochial church council or some other gathering uh, to answer the question, are you an attractive church? And he said, you will inevitably receive the answer, yes. And then the second question that you pose is, to whom? To whom are you attractive? And he said that usually starts uh, either a long silence or um, some un non-understandable mutterings, because we tend to think that we are attractive. We tend to think that we are evangelistic. We tend to think that we are missionary. However, um, uh, not, not so all the time. In terms of our outreach to others, our understanding of mission, uh, within the con within the context of the Anglican Communion, I think it's probably for others um, who have been uh, what I might say on the receiving end of what the Anglican Communion has understood uh, as its its mission, um, because that can sometimes be uh, some, can sometimes be caricatured. I mean, we perhaps have had the impression in the past that. Um, mission is about doing good things to other people rather than enabling other people to grow in the faith, grow in their understanding of what the church is intended to be in the world. And it's so often the case that in parts of the world beyond our own shores, the church is doing and being what it is called to be, which is uh, what I've already said, the good news, the yeast, the light an agent for real social change, an agent for real social justice, an agent that speaks out against prejudice and all sorts of other social ills. But as I say, I think that it's probably for others rather than for me to lecture on what I believe mission ought to be. Uh, but for those who have, as I say, as I put it on the receiving end of what we have sought to do in the past, to say what their experience of that is, whether they've learned from it, or whether it's something that they've actually seen flaws in. I'm not entirely sure whether that's helpful or whether it's um, fully addressing uh, the topic, but I hope that you will have recognized from what I've said that my own view is that perhaps certainly here, we have not actually still held on to what mission and evangelism ought to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Archbishop, uh, for giving us uh, an opportunity to think and talk about our own vision for our own diocese, gathering, growing, and going. Evangelism is not waiting people just coming to you. It is going out and providing nourishment to those who come to us and also feeling yourself more confident and creative when we engage with people to meet with them on streets, in their homes, in care homes, in schools, wherever they are. Now we have opportunity to listen from Archbishop Cyril. Uh, Archbishop uh, Cyril got his early theological education from St. Nicholas Anglican Seminary, Cape Costa, Ghana. Then he did his master's in apologetics 
and philosophy of religion uh, from University of South Wales and did his PhD from University of Manchester. Archbishop Ben has three children, Nana, Paula and Robert. He has a lot to offer to the church in the internal province of Ghana to the Anglican communion and through our relationship in, with the church in Wales. He has a lot of a great friend, Archbishop Sarah. May I take this opportunity to thank Archbishop John and the Swansea Diocese for their friendship and fellowship and to continue to look forward uh, to work, to renew friendship as we pray for return to normalcy in our lives. Um, may I use the opportunity also to appreciate the friendship of Reverend Petra, a former mission officer, and also to congratulate uh, Rana, Reverend Rana, for his new initiatives and for the opportunity to interact uh, this morning. Uh, mission, I believe, is God's divine intervention in our lives, in our affairs, and is an encouragement for us to share in the lives of other people. Thus, it is God's initiative which has come been communicated to what we have come to know as church. The Anglican understanding of mission, from my perspective, is that we are one in faith, one in hope, one in charity, in love, and again, uh, most powerful of them is the resurrection, which sums up our identity. Simply put, we are people of the resurrection, and expected to live in the sure hope of faith and trust in the promises and the power of the risen Christ. Uh, so mission does for us is enshrined in our understanding of scripture and tradition as delivered and practiced by our forebears and in our God-given resources as people created in the image of God. Thus, there is no room for division or segregation in terms of race, creed, sex, or et cetera. Ghana, I'm sure you might know, is a country of 30 million people with a large number of young people. And, and the challenges, basic challenges are education, health, and job opportunities. And the church, the Anglican church in Ghana, is deeply involved in all these, ensuring that education, health, and uh, opportunities are made accessible to people. Interestingly, the early missionaries from the UK, from sent by USPG and the various religious organizations, were credited with the sacrifices there are no more sacrifices that they made to plant the church in Ghana amidst the challenges of what was then a dreadful malaria uh, disease. And, but for the zeal, the zeal of these missionaries, they still held on to it and many lost their lives in the course of the gospel. So we can remember the zeal of missionary religious organizations such as the National Fathers. Eventually, they went to Peshaw, and then they moved around. And then again, the Order of the Holy Cross from the U.S., uh, the Holy Order of Holy Paraclete from Fitchby in York, uh, the Society of Sacred Mission, and among others. And which has seen the growth of the Anglican Church in Ghana from one diocese to currently 11 dioceses, and by, by the end of the year, we probably would have 12 or 13 because we have got two more dioceses in the office. Obviously, the youngest among them now is the Diocese of Asante Mapong, which was inaugurated uh, November 23rd, uh, 2014. So our, our partnership with Swansea has been a blessing to us. Uh, as we've shared 
in prayer, in fellowship, and in charity. Uh, let me make a specific mention of, uh, of Pauline, Pauline and Kate Banton from Francie Diocese, from one of the churches. I don't remember the exact uh, uh, parish, but they have been friends from Wills and supported uh, the Mampon Baby Zoom, which is, which is one of our ministries of our church, where orphans a day old are sort of catered and taken care of until they are grown enough to be taken by, back by their families. So, I mean, Pauline visits Ghana every, every, every year for six weeks or eight weeks with some of her friends to support the work of the, of the orphanage. And this, I believe, is part of our partnership and friendship with Fancy. And most to, I can recall, even before the diocese was created, the uh, Bishop, I, Bishop John made uh, a, a donation of a minibus from his uh, bishop's appeal for the baby room, which is still uh, the vehicle that is being, being used. So the, the partnership that we have is, is being a really rewarding one. It, it was interesting to hear I, Bishop John about some of the challenges that Swansea, as any other church in Europe and other places are facing. Um, decline in worship, decline in, uh, decline in, uh, in, in, in church membership, membership. Now in Ghana, in Africa, one of the ch challenges that we face is, is the issue of Pentecostalism. There are myriads and myriads of churches springing up every day. And then the gospel of prosperity where people are preaching, oh, God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be healthy. God wants you to be wealthy. Obviously, in a, in a society where poverty is a big issue, that becomes an important, you know, a, a lucrative gospel for people to sort of follow up. But the Anglican Church has been faithful over the years uh, and has gone on um, in terms of its mission reaching out and preaching what we call the full gospel. Um, for us, the full gospel is very important. It is preaching the word of God and missioning, uh, ministering to people, which is one, which is very critical. But the context is that you cannot preach to people when they are hungry. You cannot preach to people when they are sick. You cannot preach to people when they have no shelter. So the priorities are there. I mean, but of course, the gospel, the opinion of the gospel is the first among them. In terms of Asante Mapon, the, the diocese is very rural. So most people are farmers or, or traders, or, so they are rural. They are very faithful. It's interesting that people, you find them coming to church with no money, but they still will give up the very last city. So they're very faithful and they're hopeful. I mean, sometimes you are amazed that the sort of faith that people have, and faith is resolute. And they, even in the midst of, in the dire deep mad, they still trust that God is able to come to their aid, and which is a powerful message that we all learn from. And interestingly, making the contract, in our case, we don't have permanent buildings. So they are mostly, you have churches worshiping in uh, school classrooms, uh, churches, uh, worshiping in very small new buildings that some churches might take um, 10 years or 15 years to try and even build. But, but so that, that's, that's interesting. Whilst you have too many church buildings, we, have, uh, we don't have enough. But then again, that also becomes a benefit because you don't need to spend too much money sort of trying to heat it up or, or, or cool it down, uh, as it were. One of the things that we've done in Mampo since the DAO was created six years, almost six years now, is what we call Dazan Convention. So every year we've had Dazan Conventions at different places, and we normally hold it on Palm Sunday. So on Palm Sunday, every church in the diocese comes with members, and they go, and, and we go to a new place where there's no church. And then, so there's an outdoor service. Uh, people will sleep rough. Uh, they will sleep in classrooms or the, for two days. 
And that has become an interesting thing for us because especially the people from the very remote areas are so excited about the opportunity of joining in the bigger family, what they see as a bigger family. Because the normal church will be maybe 10 people or 30 people or 50 people. But then they come to this convention and they, they see 5,000, 20,000 people all and teaching and all. So that has been very interesting. So as I said, let me also give a brief, just a very brief history. I mean, the church was built in Ghana in 1756. Uh, and it's interesting that when Christianity came at first to Ghana, it came in the company of traders, European traders. And it is said that uh, there were three motives. One was for God, two was for good, and three was for glory. So there were what we call the three Gs, for God, for good, and for good glory. The mm -hmm. traditional understanding then way back in Ghana then, way back with the early missionaries was that, and there was a saying jokingly, if you are going to church and you see a white man, go back home, there's no need to go to church anymore because you have already seen God. You, you see him, you see God. There's no need to go to church, just go back home. So obviously times have changed and globalization has taken over. And so you see some of the challenges that you are facing, we will probably face them uh, very soon as it were. And so these are all uh, lessons for us in terms of mission um, uh, for us. And I would like to take this opportunity to appreciate and to honor the work and the ministry of Archbishop John, and especially for initiating the link with us. And so as he retires, uh, we will be praying for him and uh, we will continue to keep in touch with him personally and pray that uh, uh, he continues to serve all bit in a different context. Uh, the way forward from my perspective, insofar as the link is concerned, is that we hope that the link will continue um, at least for uh, another time, depending upon um, what we think. And uh, I think the way forward to make the link stronger is one, linking parish organizations, church organizations, for example, Mother's Union. We know Mother's Union is international. And in Ghana, we have Mother's Union. So that will be an interesting way of going about it. Two, uh, linking with our church schools, because we have a lot of church schools. And so a link with church schools in Wales would be also a plus uh, for our mission together. And I mean, very critical, I think, is clergy and ordinance exchange programs. I mean, if you have, for example, clergy who, or ordinance who are being trained, ready to be ordained, they could come to Ghana, I mean, travel money uh, being available and all that for maybe three weeks or something like that to experience mission in Africa in a different context uh, for a little while. And then again, clergy who are interested in having a bit of a bash from, I mean, from outside the uh, UK context would be welcome. So that would be a good um, uh, point for us, for our fellowship. And then again, I mean, occasional, if there is a, I mean, we could have a priest from Ghana to, 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 be, to be seconded to a parish in, in your diocese as well. And that would offer the person cross-cultural experiences and vice versa. Um, I think, Rana, it would be good to have a sort of prayer calendar among the two diocese so that we can exchange prayer needs, requests from various churches also um, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the diocese. And then fourthly, I mean, um, I mean, the baby support for the baby's home, I think, uh, is something that is critical for us. And then again, especially with the size of the staff at the baby's home, and also for our ordinance fund, because now we have uh, five ordinance in training. And in Ghana, it's the diocese that bears the full cost of the training of the ordinance. So, I mean, now we are owing, we have five or six candidates in the seminar, and it's about it costs about 1,200 pounds a year for every person. So you're talking about um, 
30,000. I mean, currently we, we are only about uh, the equivalent of 10,000 pounds from the seminary. And I've been chasing me because I became my bishop. They think that it's a good time to collect their money. But it's interesting. And lastly, um, we look forward to further partnership. And as, again, to um, getting to know uh, the new bishop if when he uh, he comes on board and also to continue to share our fellowship. So I think uh, I would I would end here and uh, maybe there are questions or issues that uh, uh, can be uh, uh, sort of addressed or feedback from people. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Your Grace. Uh, thank you, Rana. Please, yes. Uh, thank you. First of all, um, thank you again for reminding us of how importantly, um, from your perspective, you actually view. Um, the partnership. From our own perspective, um, I think it's right that I should, in a sense, apologize because we have not really pursued that partnership as vigorously as, as we might. But I see from the list of participants uh, in um, uh, th this webinar that Canon Mark Williams is there. And Mark is, I presume, still your commissary uh, here. And if I can invite Mark through what I'm now saying to get in touch with me before I fall off the perch, as it were, Mark, um, and I can give you some um, more information about how that partnership might be pursued. But I'm confident, Rana, that with you now as the officer for World Mission, that is something which we can uh, try to develop a little more fully than we have in the past. Um, I think it's fair for me to pay tribute to Pauline Vorton uh, and Keith for drawing to our attention the baby's home, and it was a great joy to be able to support that in some way maybe we ought to think about uh, doing that on a more regular basis as we do with our own um, family centers here in, in the diocese. I can promise you that through the church schools network, we will try and um, be in touch. And of course, uh, acquainting clergy and ordinands with the challenges at, at which you face, but also with the wonderful work that you do in areas such as I, indicated social justice and so on and so forth. It gives an entirely new perspective sometimes to the role uh, of the church. Having said that, in the current COVID-19 pandemic here in um, the UK, one of the things that has been pointed out is that in many cases, church communities are at the forefront of trying to maintain community cohesion, community links and community support. Um, so although I'm not going to be around Cyril for a great deal longer. Uh, if Mark will get in touch with me, uh, copying Rana in, uh, I can let him know who will be, as it were, overseeing the life of the diocese during the vacancy and see if they can pursue some of the things that you um, so kindly reminded us, um, so kindly reminded us um, about. I'll, I'll give you that promise. Thank you, Irish of John. Thank you, Agrees. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Mm. Uh, there are a few questions uh, which have already people put in the Q&A. And the first question uh, is uh, from Reverend Bashir Gill. Why has evangelism not become the heart and life of the church while it was the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, Archbishop John and then Archbishop Cyril, if you would like to answer this question. Yes, of course. Um, I think, well, I already mentioned the, uh, the Great Commission um, in my opening remarks, and it's one of the things that um, I think we have possibly lost sight of. I think one of the reasons, and I think others will be able to comment um, on this, is this tension that exists between a community of disciples and a community um, that can too easily be diverted into maintaining an institution. And I mentioned buildings. Again, very often, buildings, I've described them in the past as, yes, they are the family home for the worshiping community, um, but they can become, forgive my using this term, almost an obsession. We must keep the building going. And one of the challenges <clears throat> I issued to one of the local parishes here, not far from where I live, was, if I were to challenge you to raise a quarter of a million pounds to refurbish your church building, 
you probably um, knuckle down to it and start to make plans. If I were to challenge you to raise a quarter of a million pounds to fund the work of um, an outreach worker or a, a youth worker for five years, would you react in the same way? And so I think, you know, losing sight of the Great Commission is possibly the fruit of taking one's eye off our purpose and becoming too institutionalized. Yes, I think I, I agree with this Grace um, in his submission. As I said, I mean, I mentioned about uh, the whole question of the full gospel, you know, looking at other, um, other segments of, um, of Jesus' uh, commission to us. Uh, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and who teaching them to observe all that I've come and I do. But that's one part of it. The other part is that um, they also the commission is also to heal, uh, bind up the brokenhearted, to heal the sick and all that. So over a period, it's easy to lose focus and to concentrate on other things, especially if you have, a, in terms of internalization comes in, and you have a growing number of, uh, of converts. And then there's a sense of uh, security. I mean, you're comfortable. There's a point where you have a, a full-size congregation. Um, there are more people in the pews and you feel it's okay, I'm okay, I'm fine. But I think we should never be fine. We should never be comfortable. We should be always be reaching out uh, to yeah. do more, especially in terms of bringing people out in. Um, thank you. Uh, before we go to the second question, uh, we have Archbishop Josiah, former Bishop of Kaduna with us. Archbishop Josiah is the Secretary General of the Anglican Communion. Uh, Archbishop Josiah, uh, would you like to say something about uh, mission and evangelism of the Anglican Communion uh, or uh, about the question which was just asked? Well, thank you very much for this privilege. And, uh, good morning, Josiah. Good morning. My boss, um, <laughs> all the art, all the primates are my bosses. So whenever I, I wish I, I have this opportunity, I say good morning. Um, just very quickly, I, I I want to thank both archbishops for uh, putting it very clearly what we have always maintained uh, from the Anglican Communion Office that mission should be in context, listening to both archbishops, you will see that uh, uh, though from the, uh, the, the, the Great Commission, you could see the way in Wales, uh, evangelism and mission uh, put together uh, is being lived out, which is not exactly the same way as it is being done in Ghana, in the province of Ghana. I think for me, this is very important. We must uh, move away from expecting uh, a province or a parish to do mission and evangelism the way we do it. We shouldn't judge them. The other thing I want to thank you for is for sharing with us your understanding in your context of mission and evangelism. Now, my question is, you have said Anglican understanding, and I thank uh, the Archbishop of Wales for the three Gs, you know, gathering, growing, and going. Now, what really will make or, or makes evangelism a mission Anglican is what we call the five marks of mission. One, is to proclaim the good news. Two is to, uh, to teach, to baptize and nurture new believers. You could see that in what both archbishops have said. That for me is evangelism. And then the mission aspect is the following three. Uh, one, to respond to human needs by loving service to transform unjust structures of society, to challenge violence of every kind and pursue peace and reconciliation. 
And the fifth one is to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain, renew the life of the earth. So uh, these five marks actually uh, uh, tell us what the understanding of mission and evangelism is in an Anglican context. So I want to thank you for really contextualizing it within your own culture. And I think this is a great lesson. Thank you. Mission has always been global for the church. Global means at the same time, global and local. Our next question, how do the church recover post COVID-19 situation? How do the church cover post COVID-19? Uh, before archbishops speak about it, uh, I think this uh, webinar is one of the evidence of how we can use the modern technology uh, but of course, recovering from the COVID-19 situation is a big task for the church. Uh, Archbishop John, would you like to respond on this because you have already said and done a lot um, about this theme? In terms of the way in which the, uh, we recover, um, well, one of the things that it's challenged us to do here um, is to recognize that we have become, sorry, let me just do something to my screen. Sorry about that. Uh, we started to do things in ways that we didn't think that we would ever be able to do them. And of course, everybody, um, I, I guess it's the same across the communion, uh, Josiah might be able to, uh, to answer this, is we've been able to do what we're doing now. Um, and I suspect that uh, what we're doing now is a, a means of helping us recover from COVID-19 because it's focusing us again on, on our primary purpose. Um, we, I suppose, in our local context here, COVID-19 would have challenged us to say, uh, do we have to carry on doing things the way we've always done them? Uh, because I can't remember who it was, I've got a feeling it might have been Henry Ford, who said, if you continue to do things the way that you've always done them, then the result you'll get is the one that you've always got, or words to that effect. Um, so COVID-19 has challenged us. Um, to examine the ways in which we've done things, to see whether there are more agile ways in which we can do things into the future, whilst preserving what is good from the way in which we've always acted before. And it's also challenged us to recognize or to examine, I think, um, our own priorities. Um, Cyril and I have both said that the priority is evangelism. Um, why the church actually has to say that its priority is evangelism, I've never understood. Um, but I suppose if you've forgotten it, then perhaps it's good to articulate it again. But I think COVID-19 will help us, um, although it's been a tragic event for so many people, um, out of that tragic event, there may come for the purposes of the church, a, a, a renewed or deeper understanding of what it's called to be. I don't know whether that answers the question. I think that uh, it's been it's been a lot of challenge for, um, especially for churches in Africa. I mean, as you most of you know, uh, between in Ghana between May, uh, no, between March, I think it was the third Sunday of uh, of Lent, the second or the third Sunday of Lent, when the country was closed down, and so between uh, uh, March. April, May, June, I think we came back in July or something like that. So it was a huge, it was a huge sort of a burden for, for mission because, I mean, you have most of our ways of earning money is through the collection, there's the plate. I mean, uh, so you come, people come to church, you raise funds, put money in the, in the plate, and then you'll be used to pay salaries and all that. Obviously, when... Uh, People were at home, they were not working. And interestingly, I mean, in Africa, most people would earn, pay as you earn, if you like. So as a carpenter, you will be working, and then at the end of the day, you'll be paid. So it was a huge challenge. But through that, uh, we began to have ingenious ways of, of reaching out to the church. For example, they started this whole business of Zoom. You know, so Zoom worship, 
uh, services through Zoom, and that helped a lot. It helped people who not even come to church or to 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 listen to the to 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 to, to be part of the worship. And it, it became interesting because people would then offer money through mobile money in Ghana, mobile money um, to the church. So that helped a little bit. And again, that also helped us to, to uh, as it were, to be more genius, uh, to look forward to new ways of doing this rather than to have just stereotype uh, ways that we've done. So as it was in the beginning, it's now and ever shall be. That changed a little bit to now being more interactive and uh, finding, uh, exploring other ways of, 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 of reaching out to your congregants and, and so on and so forth. So um, I think basically it's, it's been both a blessing and uh, a challenge, uh, I think so. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you very much, Archbishops, for so wonderfully responding to these questions. Uh, before we close uh, this webinar, uh, I would uh, <coughs> invite Archbishop John to say a brief prayer for us, for mission and evangelism in our diocese, in our linked diocese in Ghana, but also around the Anglican communion that we all, wherever we are, we are more enthusiastic about it. We are more involved into mission and evangelism by bringing and activating our gifts that God has given us by uh, by bringing God into this. Uh, <clears throat> and also, uh, before we close, I would like to again uh, reinforce the purpose of this seminar was not to do an intellectual exercise. The purpose of this seminar was to listen from both archbishops and also to bring like-minded people who are mission practitioners missionaries in their own local context and sometime in other parts of the world, they have opportunity to go and to meet with people and speak to them, to pray for them. This webinar provided us little opportunity and hopefully in the near future, future with the help and support of Canon Mark and with other people I can see on the screen, we will do more to engage deeply. We will do more to gather together virtually or in person. We will do more to learn from each other. Our gathering, our growing will enable us to go together to reach out people in our own context and globally. Archbishop John, would you please pray for our own diocese, for the province and for the whole Anglican communion? Very much indeed. Can I, um, before I do that, thank everybody who's joined in. Um, and uh, especially Cyril, thank you and congratulate you again on your new min ministry, which I know from your enthusiasm is bound to be fruitful. And Josiah, good, good to see you. It, forgive my going on, as some people might describe it, but what we've said about local and the local context is something, of course, Josiah, which the Anglican Communion Office um, has now taken up and that um, we are not doing everything that we perhaps might have done in the past from London, but that we are trying to root things more locally in local communities and dioceses and provinces, which I think is really, really very, very good news indeed. So thank you for your contribution to that. Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. I'm going to pray now in an adapted form, our own diocesan uh, vision prayer. Father, behold before you our family, in the Anglican Communion, especially in our dioceses of Swansea and Brecon and Ashante Mampong. Bless us as we gather in your name. Guide us as we grow into the likeness of your Son. Lead us by your Spirit to go out and make disciples of others. God of our journeying, be our way and our truth and our life, our beginning and our end. 
we pray through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Joachim Aliyan, thank you all very much indeed. And thank you, Rana. You too. So in next minute or so, the session is going to be closed. So you will be back in your room from the Zoom. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rana. Thank you so much.